el Instituto de Gobiernos Locales de la Universidad Institute of Local Governments from Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, Transnational Institute and Red Vida, give you the warmest welcome to the international seminar New Constitution in Chile, taking back control of water as a public as a public good. This international seminar offers the opportunity for international audience to be able to find out more about the ongoing water debate that is taking place within the framework of the Chilean constitutional process, a discussion of the utmost importance for Chile, Latin America, and the world. Together with the panel of international speakers, we will analyze how the Chilean process doesn't only opens up to the possibility of guaranteeing national sovereignty of water resources, as well as setting a new uh, precedent regarding uh, controlling and democratic processes. Also, feel free to participate, sending in your questions through Zoom or using the live chat box in uh, Facebook and YouTube. Tell us where you are writing for, from, and uh, we hope your active participation to promote a valuable debate. Welcome, everyone. Water, mud on the road, water sculpting landscapes, moving meals, water stronger than fire, water poking holes into the rocks, water in heaven and in earth. The verses from Joan Manuel Serrat remind us of the impossibility of creating or thinking water without water. Two dates of October remind us to the best of the recent history of Chile. The 18th and the 25th of October, the first date, was the day of a historical moment that opened up to the time of rethinking about how we live. The 25th gives us back or brings us back to that 80% that voted in favor of overcoming the constitution of Pinochet, which is the main pillar of the civil and military dictatorship. And so Chile becomes part of one of the peoples that is working for writing a new social pact, freeing us from neoliberalism that has been submitted to for almost 50 years, as well as its devastating effects for the lives of citizens and for the life of democracy. We are building instead a pact where the value of humanity, inclusion, diversity, multiculturality, strengthening democracy, deepening democracy, plurinationality are among others, the baseline for our co-living today and tomorrow. As part of this new creation, we are called to think, to dialogue, to decide on matters that at some point seemed obvious, but that the market took away from us. Common goods, those goods that belong to everyone, those goods that no one can be prevented from having access to that should have never become private. We will address one of these goods in this international seminar that good is water. My name is Cristian Reyes, academic director from Universidad Abierta de Recoleta. And in this occasion, I will have the honor of being the moderator of this very interesting seminar with which we attempt from Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, TNI, as well as activists, workers, and academics joining us today make a contribution towards the process of recovering water as a public good. I have with me today a number of panel members, and first of all, all of you, you that are joining us through Zoom or through YouTube in order to follow the conversation. And ideally, we invite you to engage actively in the conversation for you to send your questions and also to enrich in this reflection of the present, but above everything, a reflection regarding what we are supposed to do in order to recover water. Also, we have here today three people who are highly important in the development of the theory and the action for the recovery of the water. First of all, I want to welcome in the south of Chile, but 
a long-time activist all over the Chilean territory has conducted a very important work and continues to work for the recovery of water. And we will hear about that in the seminar. Big hugs and greetings to Veronica Vilches, activists from the movement of the fence of access to water, land and protection of the environment, Moda Tima, that is the acronym that the group, the movement is known for. And the movement is women and a clean drinking of rural water. And uh, Veronica, please, your initial comments to those that are joining us today. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. My name is Veronica Vilches Olivares. I have I am a survivor of the agrarian reform and I am from San Jose in a rural area and I want to thank the university and I want to thank everyone for being here today for me. This seminar is very, very important in order to continue fighting for water because in Petorca, where we live, literally the landowners, the politicians are stealing water. They have stolen all the water. The little water we have is polluted. That's my initial comment. Thank you. Thank you for that, Veronica. We are going to address those statements later on. And we thank you for your presence and we thank you for the time that you are going to spend with us to share your experiences. Now we're going to move on to Latin America, a little bit farther away, but at the same time, closer to us in Medellin, in the beautiful city of Medellin. As we were um, thinking a while ago, the land of Fernando Vallejo, we have Fernan we have, I'm sorry, Javier Marquez. Welcome, Javier. Javier is from the corporation Penca de Sabela and also Red de Vigilancia Interamericana del Derecho al Agua de Colombia. He is an anthropologist and also environmentalist, co-founder of the Ecological and Cultural Corporation, Penca de Savila, member of the network Vida and the platform of community public agreements of the Americas, and also very important to figure out his experience of the referendum for water in Colombia. I'm happy to greet you. Javier, welcome to the seminar conducted by TNI and also Universidad Abierta de Recoleta. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to have a conversation and to have a dialogue regarding water. Especially thank you to Veronica. I'm happy to see you and I'm happy to see all of you as well. Edurne and yourself. This is a very important time for the Americas and to be here, to have two peoples or two voices of two peoples that have risen to resist against this model. Very special greetings from Red Vida, which is the Inter-American Network for the Human Right to Access to Water and also the Platform for Public Community Agreements of the Americas, which are two organizations that have as a fundamental core of their fight defending water as a common good and also defending access and supply as a fundamental human right that follows the experience of fighting of our people. Thank you, Javier, welcome. And a little bit farther away, and at the same time, very close to us and to our hearts, we have Edurne Vague. Greetings, Edurne, in the north of Spain. We understand that somewhere in Catalonia, from where that a singer and songwriter comes from, the great, great Joan Manuel Serrat. I'm happy to see you, Edurne. Dear Edurne, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And there is evidence in the south of Chile, in Medellin and in Catalonia 
It only comes to show that water isn't only a concern in our territory, but it must be a concern of all the peoples that are responsible for the planet. Adorne is a PhD in social anthropology, specialist in water society and culture, PhD in social anthropology by the Center of Investigation and Social Anthropology, CSS from Mexico. And precisely, let's talk about or we will talk about that. Her PhD thesis analyzed the uh, process of bringing back water to the municipality control with the case of Terraza. Edurne will let us know what was that work all about and its conclusions. She works also with UNESCO for the sustainable development of human in the University of Girona, Spain. And she is also part of the organization OAT from the moment it was first founded. Greetings, Edurne, and welcome. Hello, thank you so much. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure. It's a great pleasure to be able to share with you this seminar and I will do my best because of course, there are always, just like you said, that there is a problem going on. It has an impact over all of us and there are many details, of course. Maybe I'm not aware of what's going on in China in detail, but I will try to make my contribution from a perspective that allows us to see the cross-sectional things that happen more structurally that also have to be put on the table. Thank you. No, thank you. And let's see how it goes. Yes, let's go ahead. Let's go for it, right? Like you said it yourself in Spain. Veronica, for those who are watching, I would like to clarify that Veronica is in the south of Chile, like we said it earlier. Connectivity is not as good as we would want it to be. And that's why from Veronica, we are going to be hearing her voice. It's going to be similar to a radio experience, but it will not decrease at all the strength of her comments and arguments. We're going to be asking three questions to each of the panel members, and then we are going to open the floor to you, dear friends who are watching through Zoom or YouTube. Let's remember that in Zoom, we also have simultaneous translation for those that don't speak Spanish as their first language. We have simultaneous translation going on into English and Feel free to ask your questions and also make comments. It doesn't have to be a question necessarily. Feel free to state your opinion, to make comments, and also to pose any arguments that you may have regarding what our panel members are going to say. Now everyone has been introduced. Let's uh, move along, dear Veronica, with the first thing, okay? At the beginning of your presentation, you made a very severe claim. We are aware of that in China, but I believe it would be a good idea to share it in a more global manner as we're doing it today in this broadcasting. What happens? What is the water reality in the different Chilean territories in your experience, Veronica? Well, the experience as president of rural drinking water and as a woman of the country and rural areas, the things have only gotten worse with the code of 1981 where water was uh, privatized and in 1982 was given away to the elites. Nowadays, we don't have water. We have our rural drinking water for each person and we only have 20 liters that are brought in water tanks, in tank trucks that we have to learn to live with. And we had to learn to live with 20 liters of water a day and water is also polluted. And this isn't only me who is saying this, there is a government document saying this that is contaminated with high rates of iron, manganese, and also other elements as well. Nowadays, we are nothing but survivors here in the region, in the area of Petorca, because water is completely used by these people who are landowners and corrupt politicians of this country. It's unacceptable that the people get almost no water. 
It's only a few drops of water that we get and we used to live a sustainable life until they got here. And little by little, the surface water of the river started disappearing and then water who is in the basin of the river, there are illegal, illegal uh, takes of water, no one says anything, not even the local, provincial, regional, national authorities of the country, no one says anything at all. And we as people, for them, we don't exist at all. They do not care about anything. They have destroyed the flora, the fauna, they have destroyed everything, everything that used to be our way of living. You used to have cows, we used to have our own milk, our own cheese, butter, and all of that. We used to have horses to work the land, to have potatoes, onions, vegetables, fruits. Nowadays, we do not have anything because everything died in 2019. Everything disappeared slowly and actually the state in this case, the state doesn't take us in consideration at all. We feel, well, and I am in the south of Chile. I came here because I'm tired. I'm tired of waiting. Waiting for what? Now I have to go through the territories along the country as far as I can to lift up a message to convey a message of stop stealing water in Petorca because there's nothing left. We are just holding on and surviving because they've been so concerned with agricultural industry to export avocados to Europe, to the US without even caring for our lives. For them, it's more important to grow a kilo of avocado than a person who is a newborn or a person who is a senior citizen. Many times we have found ourselves in the situation of not having water for senior citizens that take medications for chronic illnesses or for children who need their bottles washed. Things that are so simple as that and our hands are tied, tied up to what they want to do. We are um, they're slaves and I don't want to be a slave. I need to break over my chains and I need to leave that territory. We've been fighting for water. We've received threats of all kinds and I've gone through so many things. And actually for me today, this seminar is very important because internationally you have to help us. You have to be part of our anger, our pain of having not having water. That is the bare minimum. And the only thing we ask for you and we suggest all of you, please think about our people, our children, our families, because we can't allow the state to continue to do with us anything they want for them we don't exist for them it's more important to export and to be number one but number one in what our people are dying here and that is what we are compelling you to do please take a look at the province of petorca it's unacceptable that we are just a number for them that's all we are Thank you. Thank you, dear Veronica. This isn't a favor. It's about justice. I would only change that concept in your request. It's a compelling request. This isn't a favor that we are asking for our inhabitants, for our partners in our territory. It is an act of justice regarding a good that belongs to everyone. Thank you, Veronica. Javier, is this the effect of neoliberalism in the treatment of common goods? Is that what's at play here and also in other places of the world? Yes, yes, we were in Petorca in October 2019 conducting our Continental Assembly and we cried alongside the people of the Valley of Petorca looking at how water is uh, taken, how it is stolen from the hands of the farmers. And precisely, Chile became the new liberal reference for the country and for, for the continent. And Colombia is following those tracks. And we know how 
Little articles of the Constitution become lethal when they are put in place in the daily lives of our people in the different territories and out in the fields. And I'm speaking from a country who is rich in water, probably the fourth country with more uh, drinking water, which is something great with uh, wetlands, with the country, with lakes, with rivers, and so on and so forth. And now we are suffering social scarcity of water because with the activism, with environmentalism that we practice, with the ideas of water justice, we are able to understand how this appropriation and that freedom to engage in entrepreneurship, which is normalized constitutionally and legally, it is a stealing water. And Article 19 that declares a private property of water given to private entities rights over water and gives them the ownership forever. And that has a consequences that Veronica is showing. You see that neoliberalism, for instance, our valid, our ongoing constitution comes from an agreement of peace among different uh, groups of the times M19, the Popular Army of Liberation, the indigenous guerrilla, Kintilami, as well as other groups that got together at that point and together with the armed forces, they were able to overcome years of conflict and there were armed groups as well. And that only comes to show how the country went through conflict and so many consequences of that. And we were hopeful in a constitutional process in 1991. And because of that, we were able to agree on a constitution with many rights and guarantees, but at the same time, the constitution left the door open for what we called at that time, the economic openness, which is nothing but the entryway of liberalism. And in one article of the constitution, it is said that the services of drinking water and basic health can only be provided by the state, particular individuals and the organized community. And that's it. And of course, later on, the legislative development took the Chilean example, the neoliberal example of Chile, and there is a law, which is 142 from 1994, then what it has done in the 30 years of the new Colombian constitution is to move towards the process of creation of a water chaos, not only in terms of supply, but also in terms of the privatization of public entities and also privatization of the sources for different strategies that range from public private partnerships as well as transnational with local governments, with public entities as well as local companies, especially plus other ways of privatizing water, which is deterring the flows, water sequestration, as it is shown in the example of Petorca, which is something very, very bad. So it is a scarcity of water, which is a scarcity that brings along a fight over water, a fight over the control of water, and the entire neoliberal legislation favors favors agricultural businesses, favors bottling companies, and also favors those that are using water. And that is why the Red Vida, we say that water isn't a good. And from the 90s, when the World Trade Organization wanted to declare good as an economic good, we said, no, water is not a good. And this will only bring damages to life and nature. No one can be the owner of water because it is key for life. And that is damaging the entire land and all the beings of water, all the living beings. And that needs to be the baseline for any legislative argument.
Gracias, a lo que debe ser a partir de Javier, thank you, Javier. We are going to start talking about this diagnosis in the, in the next topics. So, Edurne, our constitution, as uh, Javier has talked about, our constitution, the Chilean one, right? It is a constitution that is paradigmatic in terms of the use of the means with an approach that is neoliberal. I was mentioning the study that you carried out in Terraza. So from your perspective, so the, the hallmark, the neoliberal hallmark, like the experiment, has taken us to other effects. So what other effects could be um, seen in the other uh, world of uh, water hydrate, uh, water um, crisis. So, Durna, please. Well, we know uh, many things. If you start thinking about everything, it's, it's a lot. So I'm going to talk about this in a more abstract way. I think that we have talked about this before, and I am going to focus on that to be able to understand all of this. So as things are, are going on everywhere, I think that it's very particular in Chile and in other countries that the ownership of waters is private. So the private strategies go through the, the concession of use or the management. So in Catalonia, for example, our services, our urban services, or part of the associated services, are being positioned with uh, big operators. And that is something uh, weird. It's not, it's not, it's rare because the supply in the world are generally based on public services. But I would say that it's not public only when it's from the state, but also how you manage it, how you, uh, you uh, have the control over things. So why is it important for me, the role of the state? Because beyond neoliberalism, to understand uh, neoliberalism, we need to go uh, beyond. So in a more Latin American context as well, where we're talking about the colonial part. So who are those neoliberal states in Latin America? We need to start talking about the basic things, the laws of the, of the different neighborhoods, etc. But this is all accompanied to the articulation of, by other laws, uh, the water regulations and others. So this starts generating a model, which is the hegemonic model, concentration of the decision making with an architecture that is that has a regulation that goes through this process the local communities have a control over that good or those goods and then the water is subject to all of this process uh, and uh, a logic of the model of management is very based on the dichotomy uh, and this is part of the model of modernity, modernity and it's based on management and regulation that is very anthropocentric and they have this logic that ends up having this disasters in the local populations that are always affected and the social ecologic aspects as well. So this is what we need to talk about. So the communities, the uh, human economies are not bad, by definition. So this is what is going to take me to think about something that is very important, to be able to guarantee, for example, the right of uh, water, but understanding this uh, as uh, it's good that it has been recognized, but this is an individual right and that is a liberal one. So we want to go beyond. This is a challenge that is going to be posed and that is very important. Why am I saying this? Because in spaces, 
There are many societies that are non-hegemonic. So this is a right that is conceived as an individual right. So when we regulate that from the individual part, I think that is very important how to move from here to logic of the collective aspect and also how to articulate that with the definitions. This is also related to the non-systemic ecosystems, so where the systems of life of those communities have an importance, because one of the things that I saw in that thesis is that this hegemonic um, thing is also leveled up with uh, putting in the center the knowledge and the valuable knowledge only on the engineering part. And that is going to be helpful for us. And what you were saying at the, at the beginning, there are many invisibilities. There are subjects are turned into subjects that are not people. So it's, I just, I'm just going to say that for now. Thank you very much, dear Edurne. We will go back to Veronica. Veronica, you were talking about a situation that was tragic a limit situation of the communities that you know, the communities where you work. How does this uh, situation, the same situation that described, affect us if we add as a cause or an effect, because it could be the two perspectives, right? The droughts and uh, the current climatic crisis. How uh, have you been characterized? So the drought and the economic crisis. So we are going to try to uh, connect again and we are going to give the floor meanwhile to uh, Javier. So the current drought, what are the challenges in Latin America about the water resource considering that? Um, yeah, I think that we have some characteristics in the societies, in the Latin American societies, and when Edurne says that we have this, this urban way of seeing the water, the technocratic way of seeing water like a resource, makes us lose the niche of water and the ways in which our societies and our communities, indigenous uh, and farmers, and Latin American communities, have been related traditionally with water. But this is related to the farm reform. This is related to the relationship to water, and it is a very different relationship to the mercantile relationship to capture water and to be able to sell the water because it's not uh, man-made. It's in the systems in the in the earth, but it's traded as a merchandise. So all of the systems, the hydrotechnological systems, make us be able to capture it and to sell it on behalf of a, of a service. So there is a lack of knowledge in this tradition, this Andean tradition, a Masonic tradition of our uh, people of the Pacific, of a relationship with the water that is very different to the relationship that has been established before. So I think that it is very interesting what Edurne is saying, that we need to recover the water, we need to respect the water as a living organism, and we need to have an alliance with it to be able to uh, to not take it as a, as a merchandise, as a product. 
that is going to allow us to uh, cool down the planet. And Latin America is filled with these organizations as the one that, uh, that she's uh, chairing. So we uh, take care of the water. We have an assembly. We have a management, a community management of the water. So that is what we're trying to do to recover the water to public hands. And Edurne also uh, poses a different topic, a very interesting thing. So what is public and what is not public in neoliberalism when those things have been uh, privatized and incorporated to a normative regime that is industrial in contrast to the public organisms that we know and that still uh, exist. We are seeing an example we're seeing the organism of the state, the OSE in Uruguay, that after the Uruguayan plebiscite is taken as a public good, and we still have a discussion there. So this is a public organism, and this is what we say, public organisms, because in urban contexts, we need those organisms uh, guaranteed for access. We need to have a minimum vital uh, guarantee, but there are still other ways to manage water and to access to water. In Colombia, these are called uh, community pipes. In Bolivia, they have other kinds of names. The uh, apereres in Chile, these are ways to access to water and our communities do it thinking that the water is a living organism that has rights, rights, the, uh, the living right of water itself. And that's why we are always talking about the right to uh, conserving water, to preserving water. The states need to guarantee the ecosystems of the hydroxycycle, cycle and the communities have the right to participate in this concession. They actually do it. They have done it traditionally. So when we talk about crisis and scarcity, we're talking about a scarcity that is basically social of water, of a crisis, of a, a climate crisis that has water as our main um, ally to cool down the planet. And that can only be done from the community aspects and to from recovering the stolen water and to turn it, turn it in back with all of the polemic that it can be to, to have this in neoliberal uh, times. But it is public, it is collective, and it is under the citizen uh, control, and it's in hands of state servers that work on behalf to, of all of, this, of the societies. Thank you very much, Javier. We have Veronica again here. Veronica, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica. So um, we were talking about, as Javier said, about the challenges, the challenges at our Latin American level. But you, you have a, 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 an outlook of Latin America. What are the challenges in Latin America? What are the uh, water uh, challenges and the availability in this context of the drought and, uh, and climate? crisis that is added to the diagnosis that you already talked about to us in your first response. So what are those challenges, Veronica? As you were talking about drought, we do not have drought. We never had drought here. What happens here is that we have a lot of vandalism. Uh, we, have, we have drought. It rains from uh, from the, uh, the the mountains, so they have stolen the river. It, it is a it's rape actually. They have destroyed it in such a way that today they are like uh, two hundred kilometers from the basin to get more and more and more water for them. The authorities should fiscalize, and nobody does that. You can report people, to, and nothing happens. 
and nobody can say anything because if you give an opinion, you are fired. If you talk about water, the people are fired. When we talk about climate change, it could be, but in here, we do not have droughts. We have vandalism. We have water vandalism. You cannot, uh, this, this system really does not care about the environment, uh, and flowers and, and flora and fauna. We, they don't care about us either. An organization globally needs to participate. Somebody needs to do something because nobody says anything here in Chile. Nobody gives their opinion because it's like everybody's doing well. We're the Jaguars in South America, right? So no, we're part of, of us slavery. We're being mistreated. I really cannot understand how there can be global organisms where we have a problem, where the problem exists, not only in Petorca, but this has increased to the north and to the south, and we have been left without nothing for human consumption. So no uh, water, no fresh water. So everything is for the avocados and for the people, nothing, nothing, literally, we do not have anything. I really thank you for this opportunity. When I, I said when I travel, I, I, I am living uh, with my backpack empty, but I want to bring back something from Latin America to work together, to be the, the strength to for us, for our children to work together, because we need to keep on continuing for fighting for the water. The government is not helping us, they're absent, but there is a National Commission of Irrigation where they say uh, they take a lot of uh, money, but who, what is that money going towards? To whom? So this is a benefit for them, for the big uh, business people, the, the poor people like me, like the people from the farms. We are survivors. We do not have right to anything. So it is, it is just incredible. This system is a devastating system. I really, I always say that between dictatorship and democracy, the, the dictatorship would kill you just at once. But with democracy, you, you are killed slowly. That's the difference. Now the hospitals are collapsed because of what? Because of the bad quantity and the bad quality of water. All hospitals are uh, collapsed. So you, we need to wonder. Then we have the, the jails with a lot of people because we needed to take another uh, way to do things, another way of uh, living. Because in here we have a system that is not working and this is uh, this because of the water, because I do not see any other explanation. All of this is because of of this big uh, companies, this big uh, pharmacies that exist in Santiago, in Viña, that's very touristic. Everybody goes there to, uh, to have vacation from Europe, from wherever. And for example, in the, in the farm, it is very common when somebody's sick, we go get uh, some leaves and we take care of the people. Right now, we do not have anything. We need to raise awareness because I am going to give my life for fighting for uh, for water. We need to bring back water. The water needs to be for all of us, for you, for me, but not for the seven uh, wealthiest families of this country. The water is for everyone. Water needs to go back to the hands of the people, to the ones that live and work on on the fields we really do not have anything let's recover our water let's recover this for our children they already stole our rivers but give us water to drink water it's enough it is really enough we're asking you they ask me they tell me do not ask to please have things but I actually, I'm pleading you, please help us. 
the jails and the hospitals are filled with people and they do not have a way because they do not have water. Thank you very much, and Veronica. We understand perfectly that in this uh, call, this is a cry of help that many times it's the, the cry of many people. It's not just her. Javier and Edurne have talked to us as well about this, and I know that there's a reflection here, an academic reflection, and a reflection that could be, maybe it's just not necessary right now after the very hard testimonial that we hear from Veronica, but we have to advance, right? We have to raise awareness. We were saying that this has been cut by the public power, by the private power, that not only has the money, but also it has the, uh, the management, the state management power. We know this very well. When a business person that is more concerned about their uh, companies than the country, now we're talking about the, the president himself. So uh, what happens there, Edurne? How can we, how can we uh, take it back to public? Because uh, this is much more, and you will correct me if I'm wrong, it is much more than just boosting the capacities of the state. Edurne. Well, on the one side, the major issues with water are still coming from the management of the interested parties. I think that that is what Veronica was saying, and at the same time, that is the case. Yes, there are many natural disasters going on, but what has been going on for longer is the, the management of interest towards one one side instead of the other. And I've also mentioned about what happens when we know that there is a state, which is the modern state, which is basically neoliberal that follows the logic of privatization. So this isn't only about ownership from the state. It's about the articulation and governance and or management of this. And in consideration to the challenges of climate change, well, mainly we need to change our paradigm. 200 years ago, there was a point, a turning point to put in place the current paradigm and it was going to, um, and now we have to work for a transition to move elsewhere, to shift from this paradigm where water is an object which is passive, dominated, a resource, alienated, and we have to look at water as a subject that has identity, the ability to act, to generate life, and it is also a subject that has its own rights. Not only the subjects that are around water, and from this point, what or how would this transition be? We need to recreate, for instance, the knowledge that we have, and we need to go back to put at the core the traditional knowledge. We have to revalue the traditional knowledge, and we have to shift our mindset. And we also have to change the principles that are guiding all of our activities, and somehow that has to be done in or with the support of technological support. We know that our society is developing different technologies, but what is the purpose of that? To what need are they, try, are they trying to respond? And of course, that has to go linked together with the regulation. How do you regulate that? And how do you articulate the local level and the national level? And from that starting point, the proposal for me, at least, has to do with understanding flows and understanding the different uh, complexities of the different levels. And 
I believe that the paradigm that we have is sort of a linear logic, first one thing, then the other, and maybe that is not necessarily the way to go. We need to think about this in a more uh, complex manner, and we have to think about the cultural aspects as well. The organization that can be dynamic and highly adaptable, and that uh, that follows the national logic from the local communities because also you need systemic balance for with a positive reciprocity and guaranteeing that the ecosystems continue on and at the end of the day that ends up in improvements towards climate change and we are working with the observatory that came up from the urban management of water but the potential of the observatories is that they become tools to organize and to work on different skills of different administrations and therefore to stop looking at urban water as an infrastructure system and understanding urban water in a dialogue in a relationship with hydric systems and from that point on the different stakeholders have to be involved from the subjectivity of the local stakeholders in articulation to generate that logic and that articulation with the local administration to generate a certain interaction at different levels. So there are so many things going on, but I believe that I believe that's the way to go. We feel that there is potential to generate structural changes. Okay, we're going to talk about institutional changes in the last stage of this round of questions. Veronica, can you hear me? If you can hear me, I have a last question for you. Yes, yes, I'm here. Great, awesome. As you know, Veronica, and as all Chileans know, we are going through the process of the development of a new constitution. I would like to hear from you. And I would like you to give a message to the members of the Constitutional Assembly. What do you and the community expect regarding the process? What do you expect from the process? And what do you expect to see in the new constitution? That water is a human right, irrevocable, and it belongs to everyone. That is the most important thing. It can't be in the hands of private entities. That is unacceptable. And the most important thing is that it is a basic human right for everyone and managed by the state. Because it is unacceptable that the state makes me responsible as a leader of an organization for providing access to water uh, to the communities. We need the state to fulfill this with quality, with quantity and continuity. In this case, we do not have that. That's why it's very important that the new constitution, most importantly, and it calls my attention actually, that no one talks about water because we are accused of terrorists. We are mistreated. We are called names and that is basic. One more thing that I'm highly interested in is to talk about pollution because that is what's going on here. That is the most important aspect. In my opinion, water needs to be um, for everyone and respectfully and very humbly. I wish the best to all the members of the Constitution and I wish the best to everyone who is part of this conversation. I want to thank all of you, of course, because this is something that helps us. It is sort of a distress call that we are sending. We ask you, we beg of you in the province of Petorca, there's nothing else we can do. We have suffered long years of punishments from the state towards us because they are responsible. Because here it's impossible to blame politicians because they are as bad as they are and no one says anything, no one does anything, which just depend on you for you to give us something new and to uh, get the feedback of your strength and to fight on a daily basis so that everyone has water available. That's everything we ask. Even I had to 
cut my hair because the summer is coming, right? It's going to be hot. And that's happening here. Thank you, Veronica. Please stay with us because later on we are going to take the questions from all the attendees that are joining us through YouTube and or assume and there are questions for the panel members, but we definitely invite you to continue to participate, asking your questions and sending in your comments. Javier, you were saying in your first intervention something about the constitutional process in your country. Nevertheless, there were very good intentions, of course, as it is usually the case, when things are realized and put in place in a constitutional regulation, that is not necessarily the guarantee that things will work well from that moment on. So this request, this uh, compelling call that Veronica is doing to have water as uh, good for everyone expressed in that manner needs to be translated into a constitutional expression. So what do you think we should be looking after as a country in this discussion so that the same situation doesn't happen to us as unfortunately happened in Colombia? I'm sorry, the microphone is muted. towards a different situation to set the basis for water. And definitely, as we tried through a referendum with 2.5 million uh, firms, uh, signatures, we tried to put in place changes and now it guarantees something, but in a neoliberal matter, but in time, we have to try to put this in place, just like Veronica said it. Veronica has to be a key human right with access and supply guaranteed, and every human being needs to have access to the minimum amount of water to survive and to live well. And the state needs to be the entity that guarantees access and supply of water in major cities, for instance. And the water flow has to be guaranteed in a very clear priority. First of all, water for life, water for nature, if not for, for people. Later on, water for the uh, local economies, uh, water for rural agrarian economies, and water for mining, as well as other industries and economies, have to be later down the list of priorities. Water has to be guaranteed as well for leisure and entertainment. And all of this can be established at the constitutional level, and it will need legislative development and we have to pay attention to that and the Chilean as well as the Colombian experience is filled with proposals from the organized citizens from the social movements for many years. Chile has been trying to put in place a law that recognizes the community management of water in Chile that acknowledges that water is a common good and a human right even before the Constitutional Assembly and there is jurisprudence from the Supreme Court that I believe needs to be considered 
that jurisprudence that talk about El Melon as well as Petorca, and they paved the way to this uh, concept of water as a human right. Now the constitutional will serve sort of as an umbrella, but it will not give you the specific explicit guarantees that will come from the hands of people and organized citizens. And I believe that Colombian people and Chilean people have shown these ways of mobilization that are not similar or related to old political parties. They are understanding that power is something that belongs to the organized communities in the different territories with the APRs, with the different community assemblies, and that the future needs to be created in this manner. I imagine a future which is decentralized, maybe with the intervention of a municipality, also with an engagement between the government and the communities, but not under the disguise of public-private partnerships, but as something that comes from the territories. We, once we have the governments in the territory, when Veronica places herself in a position as a leader, that is because the community is making a decision, even in condition of scarcity, what to do with water. And a community that knows what to do with water is engaging in democracy and even more justice. We have challenges ahead, but I believe that the key challenge is to obtain this humanization. And the cycle of water connects us. It teaches us peace. It teaches us freedom and democracy. So the water Democrats, so to say, are the ones that have to guarantee a new society in a very different type of partnership with all the entities, with all the entities that relate with water, which are the only possibility of recreating a relationship which is better in order to provide an answer to the global climate crisis. But I think that is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Javier Edurne. You were talking about this relocation of what's public, that it seems to me that from the study of the case, the raza, as we said it earlier, maybe this could mean revaluing local governments in the water management. Can you please further elaborate on that challenge? And can you tell us how that could somehow be represented in the new constitution that we are drafting at the moment? Yes, the analysis was conducted on this process of giving the municipalities back the responsibility of managing water. And it served to me to understand the current states and also how to move the ability from the uh, general or national government to the local government. And one of the items had to do with the management of water. So the challenge is about the Chilean situation, for instance. I was thinking about that, how to recover the rights that have been given to private entities. I think, well, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a member of the Constitutional Assembly, but I think it would be a good idea to include those items. First of all, we have to check who holds the ownership of water and what is the international and national validity of said titles. And from that moment on, we have to think about what you said from the local level to the national level. We keep going back to that from the logic of common goods, the importance of the local activities and how to have public goods that are not coming from the private entities, but from people. And as I said earlier, it is sort of a perspective of the different organizations and systems of organization at the local level. And the systems already exist, they are in place and they will allow us to plan ahead for the structures that can be generated for the articulation of the organizations. And at that moment, we need to have this uh, this uh, top to this, I'm sorry, bottom to top approach. And this would allow us to understand how to 
think and how to sort of classify and refer to this in codes or in articles in the different levels of regulation that have to be put in place. That's why I talked about this multi-level, multi-dimensional work that has to be conducted because I understand that that is the way to go because otherwise you go back to this top-down way of thinking and maybe without being intending to do so, you're missing out on certain possibilities or you are leaving certain doors open to possibilities that may end up in something bad. You need to realize that we have to turn around this uh, top to bottom approach and there needs to be an ongoing dialogue so that everything that ends up being the result of this actually goes back to the local reality. And I would say that Yes, it's very good to have a new constitution to recognize what's public, but that is only the starting point because later on you have to put this in place into uh, regulations, into the reality, and that is where the point really is. I was thinking about that could that and how that could be the approach and linking this with knowledge. Let's go back to uh, to check the latest constitutions, maybe from the new liberal one and even beforehand. Let's analyze how water has been managed in the past and let's take a look at how changes took place and why certain laws were in place in the way they were. We have to understand how to generate power, power from the basis and to try to sort of uh, revert the current situation so that the constitution is able to uh, show or reflect as much as possible all the ongoing debates and to become a turning point in the face of climate change and in the face of the risks that certain systems are suffering. Because we have detected so many different elements, how do we put them in context and to turn this into reference for any future cases? And that's all I'd like to say because at the end of the day, it gets complicated and I'm not sure what is more difficult. Maybe it's more difficult what happens with activism because now we're talking about water, right? And it can get complicated. You may have an entire beautiful constitution, but the moment things have to be put in place, what happens and what are the ways to solve conflict? Yes, definitely. Let's not... Um, lower our guards, the constitution is a starting point, it is a framework, but ultimately it will be enacted and we have to take care of it. We have to develop actions that would allow us to pay attention to what's going on once the constitution starts being uh, put in place. Veronica, we are receiving questions regarding the actions of your organization in the territory. Can you tell us what is it that you've been working on? I know that you've that you've had hardly any responses from the government. Of course, you trust the constitutional process, but you are leading a process that seems interesting from the perspective of activism, as Lourdes said it. So they're asking about those actions that you are putting in place. Thank you very much. Uh, the truth is that every day we are talking about, uh, we're thinking about this struggle, right? How to visualize the subject. Because the authorities, the senators, the president, the ministries, when uh, when the Supreme Court says 100 letters per hour per person, we get like 20. So we need to try. I think that today we start. Uh, we need to start visibilizing this. I am going to start uh, going over Chile as much as I can to be able to have the authorities and uh, to talk to the authorities and for them not to to think about weird species they mistreat us they don't do what they need they should do i have always looked at my province at petorca as the the hallmark of the chilean state 
So we need to visualize this. And this seminar for me is really important. It is really important because somebody needs to intervene. It, it's not possible that the state keeps on uh, following this. The people and everybody, all of the human beings, they already finished with, with animals and everything. So they already exploded the rivers and everything, my projection. So even though if I have to lose my life to recover water, I'm going to do it. We need to think about the future. We cannot be stagnated here, waiting and waiting and waiting for what? I cannot be waiting for while my people is being sick. So that is the most rigorous thing that we need to have. We need to be strong. Sometime I'm going to have to stand up on my feet again. And I have to think that it's going to be better. And the new constitution needs to be written. And it needs to be clear that the water is a right that it is for everyone. We cannot keep on going on this path, really. It invisibilizes us. They invisibilize us for this not to be well known. Landowners have called me and they have said that you're saying that in the province there is not water. And I say, well, we are, we are saying the truth and I am going to say whatever it's necessary to recover the use of water for everyone. Thank you. You have to be here to know what I'm talking about. Many people, many professionals say one thing and then they say another thing because they do not know. And I am saying, I'm talking about our reality. I'm saying what we are living. You need to come here to see what we are going through every day. Thank you. Exactly. So we need to go from technocracy to the real life, to what happens in the territory and not try to solve these topics from an Excel file. Veronica, I want to tell you that one of the people that is connected, not just uh, technologically connected, but also connected with a sense of our seminar for today, shares with us, they also have a similar situation to yours. Maybe we can put you in, in contact because we are on the same lines. So I'm going to read what Lucas Altamirano says. The Perkenko commune uh, or neighborhood in La Araucanía, in Perkenko, in that region, the entity that manages and distributes the uh, potable water is a cooperative, uh, a profit, a for-profit organization where uh, different family members of the authorities and family members have, uh, sh have shares and have uh, power over that. Currently, the population has reported on a series of things, for example, as the quality of water and the service of the providers. So this is the same thing that uh, Veronica was saying that she's going through in the place where she lives. And also the system, the sewage system has collapsed several times and the water treatment plants have an environmental disaster and sanitary disaster unloading the untreated water. And then Lucas Altamirano adds, he has been connected to the seminar, that it is allowed to profit with water. And that has generated a series of problems in the neighborhood where one of the main ones that are affected are the citizens, the Mapuche community and the environment. There's a naturalization of the corruption and the water business that is just overwhelming. And the damage that we have seen has had no uh, responsible people for many years. So thank you very much, Lucas, for your participation for your input. And dear Javier, dear Edurne, now they're also asking us, let me see uh, the name, not to be unfair and mention it. I have killing a Chucky here. He says that it has always been mentioned that in the future, the worst will be because of water, but it seems like this future is already here with us. So this is what our friend says. And we have been in this war for many years. Uh, do you also see it like this as a war, Javier Edurne? I want to give you the floor. 
Javier, please. Um, yes, definitely. Veronica has given us a testimony of the violence that was exerted on the people, on the farmers, to uh, take them and their things. This is uh, violence that is materialized in the threats to them and to this person as a, an environmental defender. I'm talking about a, a country where it is a country that there is more uh, criminal actions, more killings of people that uh, fight for, for the rights, for the lives, for their territories in the world. Colombia is a country where the biggest amount of environmentalists are killed. And this is part of the violent expression of that control, that militarization of the, uh, of the different places that is in favor of the extra extractivism. And it is an extractivism that is multiple as well because they erase you. So when you read the diagnosis, the technocratic diagnosis, it seems like we live in territories and that the management of the water through the different community organizations is a, a bad action from the point of view of the, in, the uh, economic and technologic indicators. And this is something that people have done all the time and there is no policy for strengthening all of these processes. So they erase them, they erase their memories and they erase them physically as well from the territories. And we live in all Latin America, a process of uh, buying lands for uh, businesses, the supposed uh, purchase of fuels that wants to uh, mitigate the climate change. And this is just green capitalism when they're saying that it is uh, biofuels that fuel that comes from the soy crops that uh, ends up with territories and uh, the economy. The systems are part of the territory and are part of the landscape of the farmers. So I also think that there's other uh, ways of stealing waters. The ONGs that are uh, conservative start building and they start uh, monitoring, they do inventories because they are at the service of uh, gathering water. So there are many partners in our territories, in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Central America, in Central America, looking for water sources for the main industry that is the more lucrative one, which is bottled water. So the water war is here, the dispute for water is here, and that is why the resistance of our citizens is the only possible response to fighting the taking away of water. Thank you. Thank you, Javier Edurne. How are we doing in this water uh, fight? This is already a fact. It is not science fiction. No, it's water for uh, access to, to public goods, to buy basic goods. It is not just water. We are talking about the weird sands, the weird uh, minerals. So it's not just water. This extractivist model needs a lot of uh, liters of water as well, but what I'm saying is that it's the model itself that is uh, being redistributed. So we have maintained it because we have had the possibility of redistribution that allowed for societies to work on with uh, economic growth, but redistribution cannot happen anymore. Inequalities are bigger and not just that, but people are excluded most of the time. So I understand that if we look uh, back, it is very easy to look in retrospective, right? We need to allow for time 
When we consider the liberal states, the centralization, we need to centralize resources. So this derivation, this is related to the territory. So I need to manage it, manage this centrally. I need to guarantee the control on this essential goods. As we want to maintain the rhythm, but we cannot redistribute then we need to talk about the inequalities. We start seeing the, the damage that has been done to the environment. I think that we haven't had time to talk about a bottle of water. We have talked about the different strategies of privatization. There are multiple. When we talk about bottled water, it's much more. It is difficult to buy bottled water. For example, when I lived in Mexico, it's not you do not dare to drink water from the tap. So it is a whole market, it is a whole dynamic, because if we start talking about that, it's probably a shared reality with Chile, the water tribes, the communities and all of that. But well, the privatization really comes from many years, because this is something that it's paradigmatic. We need to incorporate the social ecological aspects so we need to uh, be in charge of uh, trying to buffer the to buffer the, the damage. I think it's very important to have this paradigm logic, paradigmatic logic. It is not uh, to go to a specific, but to talk about the structural modifications. So yes, changing the way in which we understand the world and nature, this is what we need. It's been just too many years of understanding this just from the point of view of how much we can make, how much we can profit, how much we can um, have. So we need to start thinking about uh, other things. So how much can we share? How much is from everyone? Uh, this is like the case of the water. So dear Javier, um, I think that the name called our attention, but just to be coherent to the people that have been kind enough to participate, they say, they ask about the corporation Penca de Sávila. What is that? Yes, we are an environmentalist and feminist organization of several areas of work, collective rights and environment. And well, we back up uh, uh, people and we also uh, work with the research of community or water problems and all of that. In Colombia, we have something that uh, is veredas. These are uh, like communities right, uh, local communities. And we're talking about more than 30,000 communities that self-manage water. And we are also working with uh, women in terms of gender equality, gender uh, justice, with young environmentalists and with uh, farmers' economies. So that is like our line of work. And we are deeply committed with the platforms of the Americas. Thank you very much, Javier. Okay. So we are getting to the end of this seminar. We are going to make available all of the information that we have here, all of the academic experiences and experiential experiences that we have received from our participants. So we want to thank you all for being here. Thank you very much for giving us your time to, to share your testimonials, your reflections. And uh, we are going to give you each one a minute so that you can close this reflection and start finishing the seminar about recovering water as a public good that we have uh, worked together uh, on with uh, the Universidad Abierta de Recoleta and the indispensable collaboration in many senses, not just in production, but also in terms of development, in terms of connections and, uh, and in terms of ideas. 
of the Transnational Institute. So um, thank you very much. We want to thank the TNI for their collaboration and this agreement that is going to be translated as well and from the year, uh, from the next year, into activities that we are going to be carrying out together in the same lines of boosting, highlighting, and revaluing the local governments in a new paradigm, in a new uh, position that will allow us to re empower people in terms of their sense of living, their communities, their public organizations, the goods that they share, etc. So uh, this alliance, this agreement, this work that we do together with TNI is going to be maintained for what we do in Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, democratizing the knowledge. Veronica, please, your last minute. Thank you again for your time and your testimonial. Thank you very much, everyone. Our motto is always going to be fight, fight until the last day to try to recover the stolen water. It is, uh, it is stolen. That's the truth. The water is for life and not for death. For death. Thank you very much, everyone. And humbly from my heart, help us, please help us to raise awareness for the state to respond and to guarantee the water for our communities. That's from my side. And thank you. Thank you very much. A thousand thank yous for you. Thank you, Veronica. We hope that you are successful and we really hope to see you again in other similar activities because we're not just talking about what the academia has to say, but also the academia separated from the needs, from the people, from the uh, people that uh, see the difficulties is an academia that is going to be turned into um, a, a tower that is not going to respond to the problems and is going, not going to attend the needs to the people. So as Veronica said, they suffer. They suffer from the exploitation of a um, system that is clearly not uh, taking care of people, of life, of nature, of human beings, and also for uh, beings that are not human. So uh, thank you very much, Javier. Javier, uh, I want to thank you for being here, and the floor is yours for your minute. Yes, we are here struggling to get our own law to manage water. And we also uh, call you to, to keep on working on this with the new, the, the new constitution in Chile. Pay attention to the regime that you have for the organizations such as the ones that Veronica is leading. Because in management, self-management, we have the hope that another word, world is possible. This is something that has to allow us to be as transparent as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you and thank you for everything. Edurne from Catalonia. It's already uh, sunset, right? There, to seven, oh, 5.30, okay. Thank you very much for being here. Your last words, please, for this seminar. Well, I have learned a lot. It's been very interesting. And I have been able to share with Chile and Colombia, and it's been really fruitful. Is this knowledge is that need to go by, hand by hand? Now I'm a little bit afraid of the reality. It is true that what is going on in Chile is surprising and it's, uh, it's very good. 
we need to pay attention to, to certain uh, things that could be accompanied by certain other intentions. So we are here to help you in whatever you need. We would love to keep on working with you, collaborating and learning. Gracias, Edu. Le contamos con ello, contamos con ello en tu caso, Javier, en el caso de Verónica y de todas y todos. Thank you so much. We are counting on you. We are counting on all of you who were connected during the development of the seminar. Thank you for the Transnational Institute and thank you for your collaboration and thank you for being willing to sign an agreement that will have short-term effects because it will result in other seminars as well as other academic activities that we will be able to develop where we will do precisely what our speakers have said, which is to create a new way of understanding the world, a new paradigm where what we have in common is precisely something we have in common, not only for the benefit of some. Thank you once again, Veronica. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Edurne. Thank you to the Institute of the Local Governments, which is the entity of Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, which is the entity that organizes, produces this seminar that has uh, also organized others and will continue to do so in order to follow closely the constitutional process, the process of drafting our new constitution, because as it has been said by our speakers, the process is going well, but we have to keep an eye on it. We have to continue with our activism and this isn't an easy process. There are many conservative forces that will try to either make it fail or that will try to have things just like water to be generic so that interpretations come along later on from the legislators. So we have to pay attention to that. And Universidad Abierta de Recoleta with the seminars, with uh, different teaching activities, continues to give us different elements to be citizens that have an opinion, that are critical, that know what is at stake nowadays in our country. Thank you so much to the technical team of TNI and also Universidad Abierta for joining us today. Thank you to our translators. Thank you to the entire production team, audiovisual team without them. We would not have been able to do this. And let's see each other again in a different instance to continue to talk about Chile, about the world, about the need of new paradigms. Thank you so much. Greetings, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. La Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, como parte de un proyecto gobernado. Universidad Abierta de Recoleta, as part of an innovative and critical project, acknowledges itself as part of a world movement of municipalities that are facing neoliberalism through policies and initiatives of deprivatization and recovering the public goods that are common to everyone. In this context, we start with the Institute of Local Governments, from which there is an interdisciplinary unit that will perform activities of teaching as well as extension in the scope of local management. The key approach of the Institute will be to make a contribution towards strengthening local governments as well as social and territorial organizations of Recoleta, Chile and Latin America through the development of activities of teaching, of investigation, as well as other activities that are open to everyone who wishes to learn and to share their knowledge. Of course, the cycle will tackle the different past and future protections of local governments and management, goods and services that are public, the development and territorial planning, housing, green areas, and also public spaces, infrastructure, and urban equipment. 
the Institute of Local Government will become a contribution towards the national development of alternative models to economic and social development to relive the participation of local governments in the social transformation of Chile also. We want to promote an ecological transition which is fair from the model of production, consumption and co-living in order to serve the social inequalities which are key for the future of cities and territories that are sustainable.